Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the plow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, Please go to mybigfootsighting.com. I shared some of my Bigfoot sightings on episode 117. There are so many encounters that I've had in, with uh, our friends from the woods. And it's been probably one of the, the greatest adventures I've ever had in my life, dealing with them and trying to understand them. And um, here's another one of my stories. I call it the gift, and um, this is why, but you'll find that at the end of the story. So this has probably happened about 2014, 2015, somewhere in that time frame. Um, me and my older brother decided to go to the Timbers that day because he's, he's been really getting interested in Bigfoots as well. And just like me, he grew up with them. He's seen them at a distance, but never really seen him up close. So one day he goes, let's go. I said, all right. And this is in the middle of the day. We're both at work. We said, all right, we're just clocking out and going out squatching. And uh, we did. So we went back to my spot and uh, it was windy that day. I mean, really windy. Uh, you can see the tops of the trees swaying back and forth. And um, we get out of the vehicle as usual. I gear up and grab my stuff and he didn't bring anything. The only thing he brought was two bottles of water for himself, and I got my bottles of water, and we're good to go. So we just grabbed our stuff, and we started walking. And um, we walked for about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, and get to our usual little spot, and we just kicked back. So while we were sitting there, I didn't feel anything. I couldn't feel them. And um, when I say I couldn't feel them, well, whenever a Sasquatch is around, I'll start to get a heavy feeling in my chest, and sometimes it's hard to breathe for me. And But that's how I know they're around. And um, I wasn't feeling it. And he was like, what's going on? I said, I, I can't feel them right now. I don't think anybody's in the area. And he goes, well, rip out a yell and see what happens. Well, I ripped out a yell, and he goes, well, we'll give it five minutes. So we're both sitting there kicking back. And um, then I started to get that feeling in my chest, and I was like, oh, I think we got one. And he was like, okay. He goes, what do you think? I was like, I don't know. So we were just sitting there still talking. Then all of a sudden, I noticed that it was dead quiet. No birds, no bugs. And I just happened to look up at the top of the tree line, and I can see the trees just swaying back and forth. I mean swaying. And I'm just like, oh, that's weird. And he goes, what? And I was like, Okay, brother, you know we ain't got no bugs and no birds. He goes, yeah. And I said, how come we're not hearing the wind? And he looks up, too. And he goes, well, that's weird. And I was like, oh, that's very weird. And it was kind of like we were put into a bubble. So I'm sitting there talking. We're both talking about the situation. And maybe behind him, when he's facing south and I'm looking north, about 30 yards, 35 yards out, I get a tree peak. I said, there's, there's a Bigfoot behind you about 30 yards, 35 or so back. He goes, all right, what's it doing? I said, he's just tree peeking right now. So I just turned around and just started talking. And um, I talked out loud, and I, I was talking to the Sasquatches. I said, hey, I brought my brother down here. He wanted to come visit. See if he can get a close-up with one of you guys, you know, if you guys don't mind showing yourselves. And um, I just left it at that. And it's about 10, 15 minutes later, and uh, we switch spots. And now I'm facing south, and he's facing north. And and I said, you see anything? And he goes, no, nothing right now. We're, we're still talking like we're talking. And 
all of a sudden he goes, hold on, there's, I see one. And I say, okay, where's he at? And he goes, uh, he described the tree. I said, that's the same tree. And I guess, okay, he's still there then. So we're sitting there trying to coax him to come out. And this is a juvenile, a young one. He's about six foot, six and a half foot. And um, he wouldn't come out. I was like, well, if you don't want to come out, that's all right. But, you know, at least you got to acknowledge that we were here. And um, I thanked them. And my brother said, my older brother said the same thing. He goes, thank you for at least letting me get a glimpse of you. And we both turned around and we were walking out. We get to the road in the in the woods and we're following the road. And then we get up there to the end of the road and we start walking up towards the vehicle. And when we get up towards the vehicle, he comes walking around the corner of the car and he looks down and he jumps back. And I said, he goes, whoa. And I said, what? And he goes, brother, does this happen all the time? I said, what? He goes, what is this? So I walked around the car and I'm looking at it and I'll be danged. It's a set of lungs, deer lungs and a deer heart. They gifted us. That's actually a high honor gift. A set of lungs and a set of and a heart, and they were completely dried out, and they were like leather. And I can tell these were put away for a while. And I'm looking at them, I'm examining them, and I said, "Man, this is this is awesome. This is an awesome gift." But I'm Deer Clan, and you can't take it neither. And he goes, "I can't," and I'm just and so I just went and picked them up, and there's a tree nearby, so I walked over there and I put them in the fork of the tree, and I explained to them. And I thank them for the gift they left us, but I couldn't take it because I'm, I'm a part of the Hisa dog clan, part of the deer clan. And I said, I'm sorry, but I can't take it, but I am honored that you guys gifted me. And um, I just turned around and he goes, you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. And we both jumped in the car and we drove out and we were still discussing the gift. But, you know, that is a, a high honor gift that we both received. I gift them every now and then, too. I mean, I take down leather twine, spools of it, actually. And um, if they need twine or food, stuff like that, I'll take it down there to them and um, leave it for them. And do go back to my spot, and it's gone. I got it at least six feet above the ground because I don't trust the deer. But they take everything that I take down to them. And um, they'll unspool the twine, and they'll put the bobbin that metal bobbin back in the bag and um i thought that was awesome and i've had him clean out a giant peanut butter jar on me too i mean dang near licked it clean and um they really don't take candy bars but they love cashews for some reason but they'll take cashews above peanuts any day and uh that's what i usually take down to them so that was a uh, one of my gifting stories that i got and the second gifting story that I got was just recent, actually this past spring. We were doing a pilot for a TV show. Steven was with me. He's a producer and myself. So we were walking and he goes, you want to go check out the area? I said, yeah, let's go check out the area. They're still shooting over there. So we just went out and about and got in the truck and we drove. Went to another area that I frequent and we drove down it and it's a dirt road real rugged lot of rocks so they cleared all the rocks out and they laid a bunch of brand new fly ash over the top of it and really smoothed it out it was really a good road still a good road but um the walls on both sides are five and a half feet in some areas are six feet high so one of the other guys noticed the footprint on the side of the wall so we went to that area then i found the the footprint and I kept looking the area over, and I said, hey, look, there's another footprint, and here's another one. And these are smaller than this first one. And so we were just really looking at it. And we actually walked about 45, almost 50 yards away from the truck. We're going down the hill looking at it. And then all of a sudden, it went dead quiet. I mean, dead quiet. And I'm just sitting here going, what's going on? And he goes, you feel that? And I said, yeah, I do feel that. I was actually facing west, and he was facing east, and we're on this dirt road. I don't know why, and I don't know how, but I caught a shimmer or something move 
but I couldn't make out what it was. And I just ignored it. And I was like, whatever. And I just turned around. We were still talking. And he goes, hey, we need to get back and find out if they're done shooting up there. And I was like, okay. So we both turn around. As we turned around in the middle of the road in between us and the truck, there's something laying in the road. And we were walking up. And I said, that wasn't there. And he goes, no, that wasn't. I said, that was just put there. So we were walking up on it. And um, what it was, was a possum carcass. And it was their artwork. And sometimes their artwork is a little dark. They do have a sense of humor. But what made this so different was they were legs that were wrapped around this possum's neck. And um, they were skinned. So it was just the flaps of skin and the bones were removed, but it was tied around. One leg was tied around the neck and the other leg of the baby deer was next to it as well. It was tied around the neck, but it went into the possum's chest. And I'm sitting here looking at it and I was like, they left us a gift. And I'm sitting here really looking at it. And this possum is really old. It's dried out. It's got spots of missing fur on it. And I'm just like, this is an old, old possum. It's been here for a while, but wherever it came from. And I, he was like, what's that wrapped around his neck? I said, those are deer hooves, a baby deer. I mean, a really a baby, baby deer. And he goes, that's weird. I said, it's, they got a dark sense of humor. And he was like, I guess. And I said, well, that's how they are. And um, I picked it up and we were taking pictures of it and everything. And I said, and I turned around and said out loud, I said, thank you once again for the gift. And um, I said, I can't take it home and Steve can't take it home, but we thank you. And I went to the side of the road and I laid it in that kind of a ditch area. And I grabbed a handful of dirt and I kind of buried it. And I stood up and I said, thank you, but we got to go right now. And uh, hopefully we'll be back down to see you guys here soon. So we jumped back in the truck and we left. And um, like I said, I still got pictures of the possum. And Steve does too. And um, it was crazy getting that gift. But, and then it dawned on me when I saw the shimmer, that was them in camouflage. One of them in camouflage laying that possum in the middle of the road. But it didn't dawn on me at that moment. And um, afterwards, and thinking and thinking about it, what I saw, then it made sense. I understood it because they were in camouflage. And they laid the gift in the road, and they got out of the road. And they were waiting for us to find it. And as soon as we turned around, Lord and behold, there it was, right in the middle of the road, in between the truck and us. So that was the second gift I got from them. And that was one of their pieces of art. And um, like I said, they kind of got a dark sense of humor. They do have a sense of humor, but sometimes it's a dark sense of humor. Like I said, these are some of the crazy encounters I ran across and had been in. And, and sometimes they're goofy, and sometimes they're straightforward and to the point. And then sometimes it's kind of delayed and drawn out. So I was thinking about a, one of my first encounters. This was back in about 2010, 2011. My sister's live next to the river on the reserve and uh, there's a big bridge next to it called black bridge and the, the bridge is haunted and i mean i'm not joking it's actually haunted but they were telling me a story and i turned around and typed it out and submitted to bfro at the time uh, i get a phone call back and i told my sisters about it my sisters were like okay well did you get a response i said well not yet and about Four days later, I got a response back, and the investigator at the time was Troy Hudson. He was a part of BFRO before he went by himself, and he went with No Bro, or he actually started No Bro. So Troy called me. We made a time and a date, and him and his crew showed up. There's about four of them. And um, at the time, Troy was trying to get a show started, and he brought in a, a female producer and two cameramen or a cameraman and a sound man. And we talked and we visited and laid the plan out for the day. And I would meet them about six o'clock over at my sister's place. And it's about a quarter till six. And I stopped off at a restaurant, a fast food place, got me something to eat. And I'm driving on down there. 
and I'm coming up on the road to the house. And next thing you know, about 40 yards in front of me, I see my brother Raymond running by. And then I see Troy Hudson running right behind him. And I'm like, oh, okay, what's going on here? And I pull on up and park on the side and I get out and I'm still eating my cheeseburger and him two come walking out of the woods. I was like, okay, what was that about? And Raymond looked at me, he was bug eyed and he was kind of jibber jabbering and I was laughing at him and, I, and he was getting mad at me because I was making fun of him. And then, uh, Troy goes, that was the dangest thing I've ever seen in my life. This female Sasquatch just came out of nowhere. He, he gave a great detail on her. She's about seven, seven and a half in height, uh, dark black in color or dark brown. And she saw them. They saw her. She took off running and they took off running right after her. And she ran into the thicket of the woods and they tried to follow it in there, but they couldn't catch her. And I'm like, okay, well, this might be an interesting night. And about that time, maybe five minutes later, the camera crew, sound guy, and the producer shows up. And they are getting their gear out and they're getting ready and, you know, however they do all their stuff. So we started walking the tree line east of the house. And the east of the house, it's about a mile long tree line. And I mean, it's, it's a thick, thick tree line. It's spooky, actually. Even during the day, it's spooky. And then we know they stay in there. But at this time, these guys were shooting the show or they're trying to get the pilot going. And, um, we walk in there and we're following the tree line and there's nothing. It's absolutely quiet. So he goes, all right, where's the river at? And I told him where the river's at. And he said, okay, let's cut across the field. And at the time the field was plowed. So it was straight dirt. And, um, he goes, all right, let's head on over there. I said, all right, well, let's go then. So Raymond's with me, then myself and the others and Troy. We're about 50, 60 yards up. He goes, you know what? let me rip out a yell and see if we get a response and we'll see if they're in the area. And I was like, okay, do whatever you need to do. And Troy ripped out a yell. That was a good yell. And it wasn't even five seconds. We got a response. It was about a mile and a half away down the river. And he goes, Oh, that's about 10, 15 minutes away. And we're like, okay, whatever. And you think they're actually going to come up here? And he goes, Oh yeah, they're going to come up here and try to figure out who did that. So, we were sitting there and we're walking and all of a sudden off to our left-hand side, this huge buck stood up. I mean, huge buck. I mean, if you would actually look at it, I swear to God, I was looking at a baby elk. That's how big he was. He looked at us and he did the snort. And then he just turned around and took off running. I mean, he was huge. We continued walking and now we're getting closer to the river. And, um, we were sitting at the river and he goes, well, tell me the stories over here. And the producer's like, yeah, fill us in. And we give him an update. You know, sometimes we get Sasquatches over here on this tree line next to the river. To the north of us is a, a huge long row of cedar trees. And I said, a lot of people have seen them standing right in there. And then um, while we were discussing and letting them know on the other side of the river, it sounded like someone threw down a 50 pound bag of concrete, but it landed on the bottom of the sandbar. And I mean, it, it hit with some weight. Raymond looks at me and I'm looking at him and he goes, well, there's one over there and I guarantee he's going to be making his way over here. And I said, are you sure? And he goes, Oh, I'm sure. And he's going to cross the river, then come up the side of the edge here of the bank then come up. It's cloudy. And the moon's kind of showing through the clouds as it breaks and everything. And, uh, and I'm like, okay. And about that time, Raymond says, here, you might need this. And he hands me a bat and he's got a bat. And I said, where's the gun? He goes, I didn't think we needed it. And I'm just like, okay. So we're sitting there and this producer's talking with Troy and they're laying their spill out and they're being filmed. And me and Raymond are standing off to the side. And about that time, I heard something coming up the side of the embankment. And I was just listening and listening. All of a sudden, something said my name, but it was in a low bass tone. I mean, low bass. I was just sitting there, and the next thing you know, I heard 
beat. And I'm sitting there like, what the? And I looked at Raymond. Raymond's looking at me. He goes, it said your name. And I'm like, I know. Now I'm really starting to freak out down here. And we hear a tree branch pop to the northwest of us. And he's got a in night vision scope and he pops it up and he's looking through it. He goes, there's one right there at the edge of the, that last standing tree. He's just standing there swaying back and forth watching us. And I said, oh, man. Okay. And then about that time, me and Raymond were standing to a runoff to the south of us. And I hear grass being pushed down, but slowly. And I'm sitting there trying to listen to the pattern it's laying out. And me being in the military, I know that sound. And something was coming up the side of that embankment of that washout area. It was moving up slow. And the grass was only about three foot high. So he's coming in on his stomach. And I'm just like, okay. There's one in front of us. There's one to the south of us, one to the north of us. I said, okay, okay, I'm trying to keep cool. And I pulled Troy back to the side, and I filled him in on it. Now it's really dark outside. I mean, like I said, it's dark, cloudy. And you get breaks every now and then where the moon comes through. And Troy's got he got a camera, so he's standing there in front of me, maybe six feet in front of me, and in front of him, is Johnson grass. Now, here's what here's the kicker to this Johnson grass. This Johnson grass is six foot in height. All right. And about that time, I look forward and he's got the camera panning the area from left, no, from right to left. And that moon opened up just at the perfect time. And he's got the camera and he's panning. He stops, paused real quick, then he just kept going. He puts the camera down, he turns around and looks at me, and he goes, He's right there. He is right. I said, I saw him. What do we do? And I said, I don't know. You're the expert. You're the investigator. I have no clue. And I said, well, say something to him. And Troy just turns around and looks at him and goes, hey. And I'm just like, oh, my God. No, you just did not do that. And Raymond sitting there, had his hands over his mouth, trying not to laugh. And I'm just like, ah, Troy, come on. And Troy goes, okay, hey, we're not here to harm you. We're here to study you. We want to learn from you. And he's really talking to the Sasquatch and the six-foot Johnson grass. But all you see in this Johnson grass is a head, no neck, and it goes off into the shoulders. So looking at this silhouette, he's squatting or he's on his knees. And he's just sitting there watching us. And you can see the eye shine come back. And it was white. And I'm looking, and I'm just like, man, that is spooky. And Troy goes, okay, we got one in front of us. We got one to the north of us. I said, did you know the one to the south of us? He goes, there's one to the south of us. I said, yeah, he's right over here. He low crawled up. And Troy goes, I didn't know that. I said, well, pay attention to your surroundings, buddy, because they're all around us. And um, the next thing you know, we get a whistle directly north of us not northwest, north of us in that giant cedar tree line. And it whistled. And it was loud enough where we could hear it. And I said, well, there's four of them. I don't like this. And Raymond's like, we need to get out of here. And I said, yeah, they're surrounding us right now. And I uh, talked to Troy real quick. And I said, what do you think? He goes, uh, I think we better get out of the area. And I said, yeah, I kind of agree on that. So, we were walking out and we're facing, we're walking backwards up the hill. And um, about that time, the cameraman is still sitting there looking at this giant sass in front of us. And he's just still videoing him. And the sound guy turns around and notices him. And he kind of walked real quick up to him, grabbed him by the back of the uh, shirt and the jacket and started pulling him backwards. And he goes, just walk backwards. I got you. And he's walking backwards. The cameraman's sitting there videoing. He's panning around to the north, and he's got night vision on his camera. Then as he pans back around to the left, as we're walking out, you can actually see that one that low crawled up, and it was peeking us from the Johnson grass. And he goes, there's one right there. I said, yeah, he's been there for a while. And he goes, well, why didn't you say anything? I did. I told Troy. If he didn't tell you, that's on you, not me. So we get halfway up this big hill. 
And we turn around and start walking out and everybody's kind of ooh and on and they're kind of stoked at what they saw and what they witnessed. And we're getting to the top of the hill and we stopped and we turned around and I said, thank you for showing yourselves. Thank you for being in our presence. Thank you. We just want to say thank you. And about that time, they were all whistling at us, trying to get us to go back down there. And I was just like, I'm sorry, we can't go back down here. These guys have got to go. So I have to head with them and take them back over to the house. And they were still whistles were getting more intense and they wanted us to go back down there. But no, I mean, it is my first encounter and I'm still trying to keep my cool and composure. So we get up there and get out of there and we get back to the vehicles. They're ungearing and they're still in awe. And I said, well, did you guys get what you wanted? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, well, good. Hopefully the show takes off for you guys. And I said, Troy, thanks for coming out and doing your thing. And he goes, I'm just hoping it does work. And I said, well, you know, if it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So I left it at that. And um, we parted ways and we left. And that was my actual first encounter with Mr. Troy Hudson. And if you all know Troy, Troy's usually all over the place. So good guy. I like him. Known him for a while. Like I said, my adventures have been crazy. My second encounter with my guys that were doing documentaries, the same producer, Steven, and uh, they decided to show up one day and they gave me a ring. They said, hey, we're in town. We want to do some shooting. You and Bruce available. I said, I looked at Bruce. I gave him a call. And I said, he goes, yeah, I'm available. I said, good. We'll meet us at the Powerwall grounds. He goes, all right. Where at? I said, um, over by the new area. And he goes, okay. So we all meet down there. And... um these guys are getting their gear out and sound equipment and the cameras and getting mic'd up and everybody's all mic'd up. And we started walking. And um, I said, this area does have Sasquatches, but n- mainly on the other side of the river, not this side of the river. So I, I did a couple whistles. I didn't get no response. So we're walking and walking. And it's probably 15 minutes later. And I said, you know what? Let's do a small whoop and let's see what we got. And we let out a whoop and these guys are filming and it wasn't even 10 seconds, 15 seconds later, we got a whoop back and they stopped. They're staring at each other. And I'm like, what? And the cameraman says, I've been doing these documentaries for a while and I've never heard a whoop. And I'm just like, are you serious? And he's like, yeah. And I'm just like, well, there's your first whoop. Let's go check it out. So we were walking down the river we were approaching the embankment and I let out another whoop and this one the first one was a female that answered the second one was a male and I'm like oh yes yes and I, I mean I pinpointed him he's right directly across from us but there's a thicket over there and I said he can see us but we can't see him but it came from right there and them guys, camera zoomed in, and he goes, uh, it's too thick in there. I can't see. I said, well, he can see us, but we can't see him. I said, did you get that second whoop? And he goes, oh, I got it. I said, oh, good then. So we stayed down there about another 20 minutes and went further south. And we probably walked about 15 minutes following the river going southwest. And we're on the edge again. And there's an old home down there. It's falling apart. And we're standing on the edge of the river. So I just turned around and let out another whoop. And when I did, I got kind of a bark growl back, a gruff. And I'm just like, oh, that's awesome. He's right across. If I had a boat, I would go right over there right now and just canoe across the river. And boom, he's right there. I know he's right there. The producer's kind of freaking out. Camera guy's freaking out. And he goes, it, it responded. And I said, yeah. I mean, that's what they do. And he was just like, but he's right there. I said, I know. And we were just sitting there. I'm cracking up. Bruce is laughing. He goes, these city guys, I just don't know. All they do is make TV shows. That's it. And they don't experience the real deal. They kind of freak out. I'm sitting here laughing. He goes, Steven's like, oh, I've heard it before, but this is uh, the cameraman's first time ever hearing stuff like this. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Well, at least you're covered. He is. And so we were sitting there laughing and teasing the cameraman. We were down there about a good hour and a half. I said, all right, well, I guess that's going to be it for the day. And he goes, yeah, we got enough footage and B-roll. And I was like, all right, well, good then. Well, let's get on out of here. So turned everything off, and I thanked him again for acknowledging us. And um, 
We turn around and we walk back over to our vehicles, then parted ways. That was some of the craziest stuff I've ever really had. And these, uh, my encounters like this have always been during the days. In our tribal culture and traditions and history, we were told as children, even up to adults, elderly, don't go into the woods when the sun goes down. Get out of the woods, stay out of the woods when the sun goes down. And the reason is, is because it doesn't belong to us anymore. It belongs to the creatures of the night. And um, in my area, we have a lot of things, a lot of beings. This would be like Cryptid Central over here where I live. And um, there are other things in those woods other than Sasquatches. And um, that reminds me of another story. Mr. Brian Frejo. He was doing shows, uh, mysteries, explorers, Native American mystery explorers. He did a couple videos and put them on YouTube. And um, he wanted to go out one night. And Bruce called me and goes, hey, these guys want to do a video. I said, okay, well, let's do it then. What time and where? He goes, your spot, 1030. I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, 1030 at night. I said, you know, we ain't supposed to be in those woods. He goes, I know, but Brother Derek's going to be there. I'll be there. We'll be geared up. And I'm just like, man, man, I told my wife about it. My wife says, you know, you ain't supposed to be in those woods. And I said, I know, but these guys want to go down and get video and footage. And I'm like, okay. So I get there and the guys just got just pulled up maybe three or four minutes before I got there. These guys got the cameras out. They got the truck bed dropped and they're getting all their gear on, getting the cameras out, testing everything, all the sound equipment. And I'm sitting here listening while they're gearing up. And next thing you know, I hear two individuals talking. And these are Bigfoots. They're talking in their language. I thought I was the only one that heard it, but uh, Brian's brother Keys heard it. He goes, what is that? I said, what? There's two people over there talking. And I said, yeah, that's them. Why are they talking? I said, uh, it's unusual for natives to be down in these woods at night. And they're probably trying to figure out why we're down here. And I didn't say anything. I didn't give an explanation why we were down there to the Bigfoots. I just, they knew we were there. And next thing you know, I see Keys take off running. I said, what are you doing? Get back over here. And Keys just took off in a full sprint trying to head to where they were talking. I said, Brian, you need to control your brother. I said, He's in an area that he doesn't know, and they don't know him. I said, he does anything stupid. That's an act of aggression. They will fight. And he actually took off after Keys, too. And it's pitch black down here. I mean, it's so dark, you can't see the hand in front of your face. That's how dark it is down there. So we got our headlamps on, got our flashlights. And they had a guy with them, their sound guy, Sonny Boy Fields. And he's cocky. And he was like... I want something to scare me. I want them to scare I want to be scared. I said, shut your mouth, man. You do not want that. And I said, you're asking for something that it might happen. And if you pass out, I'm not carrying you. Your boys will carry you. Because if you pass out, I'm leaving you there. I'm just telling you that right now. Don't wish for things like that. And he goes, well, that's what I want. I want to be scared. I said, you're stupid. And Bruce is looking at me and Derek's looking at me. And those are my two boys right there. And I was like, you brought them down here to meet me. These are your guys, not mine. If he passes out, you're carrying him out. And then they were like, okay, we got you. And I was like, okay, then well, let's go. So we started walking down the hill into the thick woods. And it's early fall, real early, probably around September. It's still green, still thick down there. And we were visiting and talking. And you can actually hear the Bigfoot's talking, but it was at a distance and they were discussing and it was two males at the time. And we get off the road down there and then we kind of go back to the east and there used to be an old home down there. I mean, at one time in the early 1900s, there used to be tons of homes along the river. But at the time, the river was further out. But these were like some of the original homesteads to our reserve and the families that lived there. So... 
we get by the old house and I said, okay, we got about another 40 yards to go, 45 yards to go. Then it's going to dip down into the lower parts. There's a lot of sandstone down there. So be careful. And when you're walking on it, if it's wet, you will slide down that thing. And it's giant slabs down there, but don't mistake it. You can get hurt. So we get to the beginning of the slope down the hill and we have our cameras going. We got the flashlights going, headlamps are on. And all of a sudden I heard something and it was odd and I couldn't make out what it was, but it happened so fast. And I said, who's got the recorder? And Sonny goes, I got, I said, rewind it 20 seconds. So he rewinds it 20 seconds and we're listening to it. And you hear me say, okay, we're at the edge before we go down into the lower half. And as soon as I got done with the lower half, I hear a low bass growl. This was guttural. This was low bass and just lungs. And it happened real quick. And I'm just like, okay, big boy's here. wonder who else is down here. So I was the first to head down on top of the sandstone and keys was right behind me, but keys slipped and landed on his back and slid down. And I turned around, put my foot out and he braced his foot on top of mine and he stopped. And I said, y'all right. He goes, I'm fine. I'm fine. He goes, it's just wet. I said, I told you to be careful. And I grabbed him, him, help him up and the rest of the guys come down. So we're down there now. And they wanted to break off into two teams. So, we broke into two teams. It was me and brother Derek and Sonny boy. And then it was, uh, keys, Brian and Bruce. They went a little further ahead of us and they were North of us. And I was a little spooked out because my, I knew they were there because of the way I was breathing. And, uh, Sonny boys, he goes, are they here? I said, trust me, they're here. And he goes, how can you tell? I said, trust me, they're here. I can tell. And, um, about that time, up on top of the hill, I hear a couple crunches, and I said, that's not a deer. And Derek goes, that's not a deer. Well, next thing you know, we hear more crunching and crunching, and he goes, that's two legs. I said, yeah, it is. And this is up on top of the hill. Now, Brian and Bruce and Keys are about 50 yards ahead of us, north of us. We can see the lights and everything. I said, just stay right here. Let's see what's going to happen. Well, it's pacing back and forth. It's pacing, and I can tell the speed's picking up. I said, he's going to charge. And we can hear it, but they don't hear it, but we can hear it. And Sonny's like, how can you tell? I said, watch, he's going to charge. He's going to run straight down that hill. They're standing in front of a cedar tree, which is on the west side of them. He's going to run up behind that tree, and he's going to do something. He's, I know he's going to try to scare him, but he's going to do something. About that time, the Bigfoot took off from the top of the hill. I mean, he flat moved to the bottom. It was like seconds, busting trees, branches, everything. And he ran up right behind that cedar tree, grabbed that cedar tree and started whipping it back and forth. I mean, this is a good size cedar tree. This is probably 15 feet, 13 feet, somewhere in there. And he's got this thing rocking back and forth. I mean, just rocking back and forth. Me, Derek and Sonny are sitting here looking at it and going, holy crap, because we can see the silhouette of the sass on the left side of the tree. And the guys are on the right side of the tree. And the guys are sitting there staring at the tree, trying to figure out what the heck's going on. And I'm sitting here laughing, trying not to laugh, really, but I am laughing. And I said, Sonny, are you getting scared yet? And he goes, no, I'm not scared yet, but they need to scare me. They need to scare me. I said, shut your mouth. And about that time, Bruce looks back at us. I said, he's on the other side of the tree. He goes, are you serious? I said, yes, he is. And I said, if you want to get a glimpse of him, you better get around that tree. He goes, I'm staying right here. The camera, those guys' camera turned around with the lights on and trying to see through the tree, they were all scared and didn't want to walk around the tree. Well, about that time that Sasquatch lets that tree stop and he turns around and runs back up the hill. And I'm sitting there, he's gone. How can you tell? I said, we just saw him run back up the hill. And them guys are like, just hands on their knees over breathing heavy. And I'm sitting here laughing. I'm just like, this is what you wanted. And they were like, yeah, but, we didn't think it was going to be this intense. And I was just like, oh, my God, you guys. You know, well, be careful what you ask for. I told you guys that once before, but here you guys are again asking for crazy things. So they go, we're going to go further north. I said, all right, we'll go here. We're going to stay right here. We ain't going nowhere. I said, they're here with us right now, so I don't know what's going to happen. 
So Sonny's sitting there. I'm facing Sonny and Derek standing behind me. And I'm kind of facing southeast and you can get the general direction. Like I said, Brother Derek's behind me about 10 feet. About that time, this roar ripped out right behind Derek. I'm looking at Sonny. Sonny's looking at me. Sonny's got a camera and sound equipment. And it was so loud, you can feel the vibration in your chest. Your, your, your chest was vibrating. It was that loud. And Brother Derek goes, Brother Pete? And I said, yeah. He goes, it's right behind me. I said, I know. And I put my flashlight up, turned it on behind me. Then I slowly turned around and looked, and there's nothing behind me. Eric and I said, brother, he's there's nothing there. He goes, it was right behind me. I said, I know, but there's nothing there. And Derek was a little shaken. I mean, I was shaken too. And I turned around, look back at Sonny. Sonny's eyes are big as saucer plates, and he's sitting there shaking. I said, are you scared now? And he just looked at me and he just kind of nodded his head, yeah. And I said, well, remember you asked for this. And he was just like, okay, I don't want it no more. And I said, I could have told you that, but here you are coming down here all cocky, sitting there saying, you want to be scared. Now look at you, you're, you're terrified. And about that time, uh, Bruce and Brian and Keys are walking back up to us. He goes, where'd that roar come from? And I said, about 10 feet behind Derek. Derek's still sitting there. And he's got big saucer eyes as well because it scared him pretty good. So we're standing in a big circle. Mm, decent sized circle. It's probably about maybe 16, 17 feet in front of us in a big circle. And they were like, okay, where can we go next? I said, uh, I think we ought to call it quits for the night. You guys got enough audio and you guys seen things down here. I'm hoping that you guys caught it on video, but I think it's time for us to get out of these woods. And I think we need to get out of here quick. As soon as I ended my sentence with quick, this log tree branch, it was pretty decent size. I could probably give it about 25 pounds, maybe 15 pounds, but it, it had some weight to it. It landed right in the middle of the circle in front of us. And I said, okay, there's our sign. It's time to go. And we all looked at each other and said, okay, it's time to go. So Brian's like, all right, Pete, lead us out of here. So we were walking out. We're walking up the hill then we get back to the old house that was standing there and brother Derek and Bruce took off before us because the road is just right there it's probably about 40 yards in front of us they get up there and turn around and come back and I said what's going on they said the road's not there I'm just like it's just right up there and as soon as I said that and I looked towards that area everything changed it wasn't the same tree setting that was there before when we first came down. This was totally different, way different. It kind of blew my mind. I said, okay, we're not in Kansas anymore, boys. Where are we at? And Brother Derek said, monotony wadis. I said, I didn't see any down here, and I didn't hear any. And monotony wadis in our language, in the Ponca language, means little people. And I said, I didn't see any, and I didn't hear any. And he goes, it has to be. I said, not necessarily. I said, depending on the Sasquatches we're dealing with, they're showing us a little bit of power. They have. And he, he goes, what do you mean power? I said, magic. And you guys walked up there where that road should be. It's not up there. I said, hold on. I went up there and double checked. The road was gone. And I'm just like, okay, this is really weird. Never been in a situation like this before. This is odd. And he goes, what do we do? I said, everybody back to the house. So we would turn around and walk back towards the old house. So we were sitting there. He goes, what do you think? I said, all right, this is what we're going to do. We know the road's up there. We know it is. And he goes, yeah. And I said, this is what we're going to do. You walk 15 feet, stop. I'll come past you and go 15 feet beyond you and stop. Then you're going to leap up 15 feet in front of me. And I said, in theory, the road should be there. And we were almost to the road, my turn. I stopped. I'm about 25 feet, 30 feet away from the road. And this time, Bruce comes around me, and he gets up there and walks that extra five feet. And he goes, the road is here. I said, thank goodness. And 
Derek was still sitting there freaking out. I know those little people. I know they did this. I said, no, they didn't. It wasn't them. And I said, come on, guys. And I said, just follow the light up to me. Then follow Bruce. Bruce is standing up there on the road. So go up to Bruce and I'll be the last tail out of here. And we did. We finally got out of there and we got to the road. We're walking on the road and we're kind of laughing around and we're really making fun of Sonny Boy because his eyes were big as saucers after that roar hit us. And Sonny Boy goes, I wasn't that scared. I said, yes, you were. You were sitting there in the big saucer eyes and you were shaking. You were scared. And everybody was just laughing at him, making fun of him, teasing him. And um, we finally get up to the vehicles. And um, I said, well, you guys get enough? He goes, well, uh, where's another active spot? I said, if you jump back on that main dirt road that you came in off that hard top, he goes, yeah, go south. You're going to come to a corner turn. That'll take you directly west. That's county line. Right there at that corner is highly active. And he goes, Okay, at the corner, I said, trust me, as soon as you hit that corner, there's a big thicket of trees on your left-hand side. You cannot miss it, and it's going to be a sharp turn going west. That's the corner of County Line. Now, in that thicket right there, that big wooded area, it has other things other than sasses in there. I'm just letting you know that right now. Okay, well, I guess we're going to head on down there and check it out. I said, all right, well. You guys be careful. I'm telling you, be careful because you're not in your home grounds. You're new to this area. You don't know this area and you don't know what's in these woods. I'm just letting you know. You guys be careful. He goes, okay, okay, we, we got it. We got it. And so we're all in gear and everything's put away except for a couple cameras, a couple microphones. They all jump in the cars and they head on out. And Bruce jumps in with Derek. I jump in my car and I follow him out. That was the end of the night for me. The next day, I get a phone call from Brian. And Brian's like, Pete, we went down to the county road corner, like you said. I said, yeah. And I said, what happened? He goes, it was some of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life down at that corner. My sound man left me in those woods, and he was sitting in the car waiting for me. I said, what happened? And they told me, we got there at the corner. We get out, got our camera gear, and we went directly to that corner. We saw into those woods and we walked in there and we were in there maybe 15 yards. Now I noticed a set of eyes in front of me, maybe 25 yards away, 20 yards away, but they were bright eyes. I knew and they were low to the ground. He goes, man, that is a big dog. And, um, his sound man, oh, I can't even think of his name. It's been so long, but anyway, the sound man saw it. And it scared him. So he was slowly backing up, heading to the car. Didn't even tell Brian he was leaving. So Brian's sitting there videoing this camera. He's videoing these set of eyeballs. And those eyeballs are about 20 feet away from him. And it stops. It looks at Brian. And Brian says, man, that is a big dog. You can actually hear him say that on the video. Well, next thing you know, these eyeballs stood up. And they were at the eight-foot level. And he was like, okay, that's not a dog. That is not a dog. And he's backing up slowly. And he was trying to find his sound man. He turns around, looks at the car. The sound man's in the car, turned around and staring at him. And Brian's like, oh, crap. And Brian's slowly trying to walk out of there at a decent pace. And he finally gets to the car. He jumps in the car and he was yelling at his sound man. Why did you leave me? He goes, I saw them eyes. The heck was that? I, I didn't even say that. I just automatically left. So they ended up leaving and got out of there quick. So the next day they're running through footage and he actually sent me a copy of it. And I'm watching this footage. And while he's standing there staring at these eyes and you see the eyes go to the eight foot level, what he didn't notice at the time was on the right side and the left side of him were two more sets of eyes. He didn't even see those eyeballs there. So he had three Bigfoots in front of him, one on each side and one standing in front of him. And he didn't know that. I said, did you see the other two sets of eyes in there? He goes, no. I said, go back and look at him. It. It's on the right and the left side of you. But you're watching that dog you thought was a dog then it stands up there are two sets of eyeballs on each side and he goes are you serious and he goes back and checks it out and he goes oh crap there was three of them right there i said yeah there was three of them right there with you 
then it kicked in on him. Then he got scared in the middle of broad daylight. And I said, calm down. You're at home. You're fine. Just mellow out, guy. You're all right. It shook him pretty good. Three weeks later, I get another phone call, and he wants to do a day investigation. And um, I said, all right. He shows up. We go down to my spot. This time, I got my grandkids with me. I got my granddaughter with me, Donina, and I got my grandson, Nicholas, with me. And they're little at the time. So I'm probably saying eight and maybe, hold on, take that, maybe nine and seven. And we didn't have any sound guys. I said, do you guys want to be the sound guys? And they're like, yeah. So they were holding the mics and we're walking through and we're talking as we're going. And um, we're probably about 30 minutes into our walk. And it was just a weird vibe around us. And um, with Brian, there was another guy with him. His brother Keys was with him. And all of a sudden, we had this weird smell. It was a sweet smell. And the only thing I can relate it to were honeysuckles. But we don't have honeysuckles down there. And um, I said, that's what that smells like. And we're sitting there trying to figure it out. And Keys goes, hey, I just saw something walking off over here into these bushes. And I said, did you get it on tape? He goes, I don't know, but it's still going through. So we put the camera on a tripod. And we left the camera going. The camera is facing north. And we walk on over there. And you can actually hear something walking off into the thick bushes. And I said, I don't know if I want to follow this one. I got a weird feeling. And it's just, it's weird. And they were like, okay, your feelings have been true to the point. So we're going to listen to your feelings. And we're not going to mess with that one. We're going to turn back around and head back over to the camera. So we head back on over to the camera. The scene was a little different. To me, when we first got there, it looked like there was a sass in front of us in front of the bushes, squatting down, but it was in camouflage. You can see an outline of it. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. So we get back over there, and I noticed that it's not there anymore. And I said, Brian, rewind that video from when we first put it down and we left. And he rewinds it, and I said, watch. And we actually watched the video. And there was a Sasquatch that was squatted down in front of us, and it was probably 15 feet away from us. As we left to run over there to that area where Keys was at, and my grandkids went with us, it wasn't even, shoot, I, I don't even give it 15, 20 seconds later, that Sas that was sitting in front of us stood straight up. You can see the outline of him standing straight up. He turns around, then he starts going through the bushes heading north. And... That's what we saw on the video. And Brian was freaking out. And he goes, it was right here. And I said, yeah, it was. I thought I saw something there, but I wasn't sure. So I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. So I just left it alone. But in reality, there was a Sasquatch that was squatted right there watching us. And um, my, my grandkids were like, that is so neat. He was right there. And I was like, yeah, he was. He goes, Oh, I wish he could just see him in his full physical. I wanted to see what color his hair was. And I just started laughing. I said, nah, you probably would have started screaming and crying. I mean, I had to carry you out of here. And he's like, no, 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 Grandpa. You wouldn't have carried us out. And I just started laughing. I said, all right, guys, we're done for the day. And we got a lot of good sounds and good audio and video. And we left. So Brian's putting that one together. And he goes, Pete, there is so much stuff on here we didn't even see. I said, I believe it. And he goes, all right, well, I'll finish it off and put it together and I'll send you a copy. And I said, all right. So that's where we left it with Brother Brian. And that was uh, Native American Mystery Explorers. If you guys want to check it out, it's on YouTube. But like I said, there was a lot of good stuff down there. And um, I'm looking at the time right now. So, you know, this might be the end of the stories. I just still touched up on some of them. I still got a ton of stories to tell. But like I said, you know, in my time I've been doing this, I ran across other things that's in the cryptid area. Besides Bigfoots, there's dogmen, there's little people I've ran across. I even think I ran across a, a Thunderbird at one time and seen a Thunderbird at one time. 
But um, like I said, you know, I ran across some crazy things in my time in those woods. And those woods are very, very old. But like I said, you know, be careful what you ask for when you're out and about in those woods. Don't think that you're brave enough or you're going out there with a cocky attitude because I guarantee those woods will put you back into perspective real quick. And remember, respect is key. If you're trying to understand Bigfoots and you're trying to deal with them and you're trying to get a one-on-one, respect is key. There's nothing wrong with gifting. Just let them know that this is a gift. Don't be expecting it all the time and put it up high because you don't want the deers getting hold of it, especially if it's nuts or fruits or stuff like that. You know, like I said, you know, in my time in these woods, I've enjoyed it. I've been shown a lot of things that normal people don't get to see. And I've taken people down there to see them and they were blessed enough to get to see them because they went ahead and decided to show themselves to them. And in our culture, uh, that's considered a blessing. You know, you got to see something that no one else ever gets to see. And if you get a chance to run across one, that's a blessing as well, because you get to see something that no one else ever has, ever has seen. And you were told it doesn't exist. It does exist. Bigfoots are real. I've had my close encounters. I've been up and close to them within a foot. I know they're real. But like I said, these are my stories. And these are my encounters. And everybody's different. And some people will say, well, they're aggressive in my area. Well, if you look at the area, have they been shot at? And if they've been shot at, they will be aggressive. You need to go in there with an open mind and an open heart. And you need to talk out loud and tell them why you're there. They'll listen to you. Believe it or not, they'll listen to you. They'll scan you before you even get out of your car. They'll tell you what kind of person you are. And if you get to see one up close or you get to hear them walking around you, that's a level of trust. Then if you get to see it later on, maybe a couple more visits down there and they decide to show themselves to you, that trust is getting stronger. Just be open and honest. Be respectful. Remember, you're going into their home. If someone comes into your home, you expect to be respected as well because that's your home. It's the same way when you go into them woods. Respect is key. So I do believe that is my time. I've enjoyed myself. If you guys want me back for more stories, I have no problems in coming back and telling you guys more stories. Like I said, these are my encounters, and I got the witnesses to back them up on my encounters. So that's it for tonight. Thank you. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five string melodies groove in. At the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music, yeah. The sound of a memory brings me back to the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track. His pickup man had been through it. Getting through the day on Scruggs and Skaggs, booking a bales to those Tennessee jams. There's no other way that I'd do it. I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Summit on the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the drummer looking Kentucky star Those are the anthems drumming out country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out
rushing by With the bass on the stereos booming And I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Best sweet tea, come and say.